What's up, Dom? How's it going? Hey, man. I'm having a time. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you back a bus. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did this happen? Like, how did how did you manage to get Dom to India? So, I think we first got in touch. We, uh, I mean, first spoke, I think, rather, in 2018, mm -hmm. when we were releasing a new Godless EP, and I uh, went uh, got in touch with Tom to see if he'd be interested in laying down a guest solo, and he was kind enough to do that and that's how we spoke for the first time and uh, we met in uh, Germany once as well after that when we had a gig there and he had put up a post I think or a story who was the CV in India or something of that sort right mm -hmm. I did yeah. yeah so I was like hey you want to come to India he's like yep <laughs> like cool let's make this happen <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much as simple as that yeah sometimes but, the universe aligns and you know the connections that you've made along the way just come together for something and I, I remember just waking up one morning feeling like, wow, it's been five years since I've been in India and I really want to come back. And I've wanted to come back for a while, but now it suddenly feels real mm -hmm. and I just need to communicate it to people and didn't expect anything to happen. But then Abbas got in touch and hey, we can make this happen. Do you want to make this happen? Mm -hmm. So here we are. Yeah, awesome. But yeah. you've been to India before, right? Yes, I've been here in 2000, I think it was also 2018. Um, yeah. Or 17, one of the 18, two. yeah, 18 actually, yeah. <clears throat> and so I had a master class in Bombay. Uh -huh. And um, it, was, it was a really good experience, but at that time I was also a little bit bummed about the fact that I didn't get to see other parts of the country because that was very much the plan. And so now, on this tour, that has finally happened and I'm so, so happy about that. Right. Uh, and did you come as part of a band that time or was that also a solo trip? At that time, also mm -hmm. a solo trip, yeah. Right. But that was a masterclass thing, so there was never any intention to bring a band or right. to play right. uh, a whole set. So that was purely a masterclass thing. Right. But this time, like, I think you guys, you've done a solo gig in uh, Hyderabad, in uh, Guwahati, Kolkata, Shillong, mm -hmm. Bangalore. Mm -hmm and then Chennai. Mm -hmm. So have you been doing this solo set uh, before? No, like everything about this is brand new. Oh. So until just a few weeks before the tour started, I didn't have a solo set and yeah. I didn't have the um, technical infrastructure to play solo and I had to develop all of that from scratch. And you know, some about the things that I prepared and have, and have worked really well, some not so well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just had to accept the fact that this being the first time on stage as a solo artist, first time on tour as a solo artist, first time playing a set, first time playing a lot of these songs outside of a controlled recording environment for the first time, um, first time talking in front of people at a mm -hmm. gig, and so on and so forth, to the point that the first time in all of these cities in India, I just had to accept the fact that it was going to be a learning curve and mm -hmm. a learning experience. It was not going to be perfect, but it sure as hell was going to be fun and that it has been. Right. And what, what was the music that you were playing uh, at these shows? So I really wanted to make it, I don't think you can say a best off because mm -hmm. that makes me feel like I'm part of the Rolling Stones, which is clearly <laughs> not the case. Like on a very, on a much smaller level, I still wanted to play a set that reflected the, the things that people who knew of me would want to hear. Mm. Even though that means playing songs that I had never played with before or had never considered playing before. <clears throat> but I wanted to have people to have people that have this reaction of, oh yeah, that's the song I've never got to hear from this person who wrote it uh, and still bring that. Mm. So it's that, it's um, that w well, much more than the songs that I would have liked to play. Um, but then I also brought brand new music, which I'm really excited about and happy to play from my upcoming new album. So it's a mix of those two things. Right. And Abbas, how was it booking a tour for a solo artist as compared to, let's say, a Band. Um, it, it was tricky because, you know, like, I mean, the band, so all, the promoters in each city also asked, like, so there's not going to be vocals, it's just going to be a guitar and back. And I was like, yeah. I said, yes, this is how it's going to be. So they, they weren't sure how it will go, uh, how it will go off. And he, Tom himself was actually, was not, not too confident of this thing. And then I remember, I was like, wait, 
we I remember when Jeff Loomis came to India and he did, he did exactly the same thing and it went off really well. Mm-hmm. So I was like, hey, we can do the same thing. Why not? And let's make it a bigger tour. Loomis had come down for I think two or three sh- shows. I was like, let's do six, seven shows mm-hmm. and end it with the camp here. And I was pretty confident and I obviously know how incredibly well he plays. So mm-hmm. just a matter of getting him on the stage and yeah, it, it mm-hmm. wasn't it wasn't too difficult to actually book the dates at the end of it. Nice. And uh, I think you were supported by some Indian bands as well, right? Yes. I mean, we had local bands opening the show for mm-hmm. every gig, but the most important thing also for me, uh, such a good experience was touring with Gutslit. Yeah. Ah, oh, such a such a cool band, yeah. so, such cool people, cool guys, super yeah. helpful and super fun to be around, and also helped me a ton with technical issues that I that I had during the tour, and I can't imagine having ha- done this tour with another band. Mm. Like, hands down, this this has been a very positive experience touring with them. I can't wait to do it again. Well, awesome. What would you say is like the funniest thing that happened in the tour? <laughs> that you can mention here. <laughs> They're all X-rated. <laughs> so little sign of a good tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, not sure. What What do you say? Hmm. Was. Mm. I would say trying trying to get you to wake up is was definitely a trip. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've I've experienced that first time. <laughs> it, it is. Um, more difficult than you could ever yeah. imagine. <laughs> now, now the X-ray did make sense. Now I understand. No, no flights missed. No flights missed. That was <laughs> I think Abbas has like a record, at least in the metal community, of missing the most flights. I can totally see that. <laughs> but yeah, hey man, we can be proud of ourselves because we yeah. kept each other in check. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there were moments when I had to be, you know, reminded of a flight and then the other way around and we got it done and it was a really good combination. Yeah, and uh, honestly, uh, See, before this, we were just like acquaintance, just knew of each other, really. Mm. But our, like once the tour started and I was like, you know, three weeks spending with someone, like going, traveling right. from city to city, I don't know how we'll get along, you know, like, I mean, we have like, we need to have our own space or whatever, but like, it's just been super awesome, super smooth. We've been like, I can say like, you're good friends now because of this as well. Yeah, I can say the same. Yeah. Yeah. This has been, like, I again, I can't imagine having done this tour with somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes these things just work out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to have that chemistry, like whether it's yeah. a band or whether it's a band you're touring with as well. Like, I mean, I'm not playing or anything, but I'm still, you know, you spend, just spending time with someone else. Yeah, yeah. traveling for that with period of time, and you have to kind of get along. And, and you, you kind of feel like you're in a band now. It's exactly. a temporary band, yeah. but we're totally in a band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. So it's been super nice that way. And like, you've kind of just bonded over a lot of different things, not just music, you know, like talked about random stuff and it's yeah. been awesome. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Talk to me about that beautiful piece of gear that you have there. Well, that is um, my 070F, which is called, uh, from Aristides Guitar. So that is the company that I've been working with for the last four years, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have solved so many problems for me. It's such a cool company, amazing people behind that, really, really helpful. And one of the requirements that I have to be working with a guitar company is that they are able to make me fretless guitars because mm-hmm. that's a big part of what I do. And I've had many offers and talks with companies that I really liked, but it was never in the cards of them making a fretless model or even considering making this a production model, which is a thing I want to do. I want to bring fretless guitar to more people. That's mm-hmm. one of the missions I feel I I yeah. have in life and Aristides have been with me on that mission and they have built many prototypes leading up to this beautiful instrument here and also by this point it's not a production line yet mm-hmm. but anybody ordering an Aristides guitar you know, whether it be six string or seven string or possibly eight string can now ask for a fretless option to make it fretless. To any of their beautiful. other guitars you mean. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And so yeah, it's uh, Aristides. Um, we have bare knuckle pickups in, in here. Mm-hmm. Um, as you can see with my custom Fountain pick logo. covers. And yes. uh, a couple of other things that I have in my guitars, like for example, tone and volume are switched. So I have the tone in front and the oh. volume in the back. Why is that? That is um, because a lot of times I will be operating the, the tone knob while I'm playing. Oh. Um, so a lot of people, guitar players, are really obsessed with getting attack and pick attack and uh-huh. picking. 
I'm the opposite. I hate picking and I don't like the sound of picking. And right. I, if I can, I want to obscure the pick attack. And a lot of times I will be playing a line with the left hand and then roll down the tone. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I have it in front so I can reach it's for it. It's easier to yeah. So then it will be more like a like a muffled trumpet sure. sometimes. And then I, for effect I can roll the tone completely off or completely on. And also <clears throat> because of that it's a 15 degree angle. So I can have the full spectrum of open and closed within just a tiny movement. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yesterday during the workshop, you were talking about um, the guitar a lot. And it's really interesting all the stuff that you showed. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you even yesterday was, uh, how, how many years have you been playing guitar? <sighs> That's so embarrassing to say, because right. if I say 30 years, which is true, okay. then it makes me feel like I should be a lot better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, if you're going to say that, I don't know <laughs> what the rest of it us is, have to say. It is the most authentic answer, I can Sure, and, so, uh, and, yes. and how many years out of that uh, were you playing? I mean, okay, but then, and what about the fretless? How many years have you been playing? Mm, I guess about 15 years on and off. But it's not like I've started fretless guitar and then I have been playing this all the time since then. Because the reality of playing fretless guitar is that... Um, you don't get offers because you play fretless guitars. It's the opposite. You're actually being excluded because you play fretless guitars. Like I've had conversations with bands that would tell me, wait, what, you're available as a guitar player? I thought you only played fretless guitars. Like we, like we needed a guitar player two years ago and this mm. was a band that I really would li have liked to be in. Right. But yeah, we didn't know you would be even interested in playing normal music, normal fretted guitar and I've always done both and whenever I had the opportunity to develop the fretless and to work with it, I have, but the reality of it is that I don't get paid to play fretless guitar. This is a hobby and this is like a passion for me, mm -hmm. so I have to make sure that I don't lose that um, and most times I can't even spend time practicing because no project requires me to play fretless guitar unless I make it so. Mm. And I've been very fortunate in that way, even though it's a difficult situation, that some of the things that I've done on fretless guitar have gained some attention so then people would actually reach out and say, hey, can you play a fretless guest solo? And that always makes me happy mm. because otherwise I, I have to fight for it. But that's another thing that I try to change through my work over time, that more people pick it up. And uh, I have seen that. I have people have been telling me, and students of mine have been telling me but that that inspired them, and they put it in their own music. And the more acceptance, and the more, um, yeah, the more attention we have on fretless guitars, the more people will gravitate to it. And then hopefully times will change, and it will become a mainstay in the guitar scene. That right. is my dream. Yeah, awesome. In fact, like, um, unfortunately, our Carnatic mandolin teacher was unable to come because, mm -hmm. you know, of a personal emergency. Uh, but I would have loved for you to meet him because uh, in Carnatic music, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Gamakas. Yes. So Gamakas is essentially what you end up, to, what you were show, a lot of what you were showing yesterday is what in Carnatic music, we call it as Gamakas. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of context to all of that that you were showing yesterday right. in the Carnatic world as well. But next time. Next yeah. time, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would love to deepen my knowledge about that and um, just learn from people who have mm. a deep history of that that tradition, mm. 100%. So your uh, your style of playing, basically, like we were, we were discussing this the other day as well. Uh, lately, if you listen to a lot of guitarists, you can't tell who's playing what. They, people don't have a unique style. Unique voice. Really. But your guitar, when you can hear a fountain and solo and know it's you playing. Yeah. And uh, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, and, and there's also a lot. I mean, I don't know if it's conscious or, but it does seem like there's a little bit of a Carnatic influence also with the slides, mm -hmm. especially. So but I you, couldn't say it's a Carnatic influence right. because I'm but a hack, and I hear things, and this has been my entire career basically that I, I'm, I have not had a f solid musical upbringing, or um, I have never been in music school and university, but what I have done is just let myself be inspired by a lot of different things and then I always say that I have, that I'm very happy um, to be part of the last generation coming up in guitar playing before YouTube. 
Mm. And that has made all the difference because I didn't have access to people showing me how it's done for the things that I got inspired by. And so I always had to find a way around that. I had to find a way to get close to what I was hearing with the tools that I had available and the things that I could come up to get close to that. And in most cases, I, w I found out later to my amusement and amazement that the methods I had developed to get close to that sound that inspired me was a completely different method than was actually used. Mm. But then I got, got to develop these methods into something of my own, uh, which probably wouldn't have happened if I had yeah. grown up a couple of years later and, every, and access to YouTube and people showing you how it's done for literally every imaginable thing. And so the Indian influence has always been there, but just as, as much as there has been an influence from Turkish music or Chinese music, and all these things are things that I find really interesting and beautiful, and I basically run them through my filter, and then they come out in my playing. And I would love to sit down and study all of these traditions um, and be more adept in making that reality. But um, if that is not the case, I still get to incorporate that into my style by dabbling. And I think that's really important. I speak about that all the time in workshops, the importance of naivete, mm -hmm. that you don't approach things in the, in the spirit of, I can't do that because I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in, of all of these things, but I'm an expert in being myself and building my own style. And if I want to incorporate something in, into that style, I can. And then the fact that I don't know anything about that specific tradition doesn't stop me from doing it. Um, as long as I have the humility to say, well, I don't know anything, but I just love trying to imitate that sound and have fun. And that has been the case. So. Also now, uh, go back to the tour actually, no? and, uh, and you've been playing, you've, uh, like, uh, you know, showcasing a couple of songs from the new album. And <clears throat> me being in the audience, I, I really see people's expression at that point where they're really liking it. Yeah. And, and a lot of people have come up to me and asked, like, what song is this? And, you know, like, and so the new song is already, at I mean, the taking shape and this is the unmixed version, but still it sounds, already sounds great when you play it live. Awesome. So, can you talk a little bit about the new album and the, the collaborations you've got yeah. and the style of music and how long it's been in the works? Yeah, so this new album basically started off as my, um, as my lockdown project. Okay. Um, so, as we all had some time, I, for the first time in years, where I had just been frantically working on other people's music, uh, making a living, suddenly I had the time. And then I wanted to start a project, but it, I wanted to do a different album. I wanted to do something that I had, I had wanted to do as a solo album for a long time. And suddenly, you know, in lockdown, you talk to people that you haven't talked to in a long time because everybody's got time. So I'm talking with a, a friend and colleague of mine and uh, who's also been a member of uh, a certain band at, at one point. And we were talking about the fact that we don't like not being able to play the songs that we have written for this band. So suddenly the idea was born to make it a duo project. Let's sit together, write new songs, make a duo project, and then we get to maybe go on tour and play all the old stuff for people. That'd be awesome. So we, we started. And then through a chain of various events, he dropped out of the project and he ended up playing with that band again. So he didn't have the need for that project anymore, but I still did. But suddenly I had eight songs prepared. So I made a decision to do this as a solo album instead and really um, get into this particular style that we call technical death metal for the first time in many years and um, just try to see if in the meantime I had have new things to say, new things to bring to the table. Um, I mean my goal is always if I work in a certain style to see if there's something that I can contribute that maybe hasn't been fully explored so that was the case with this. And um, basically pick up where I left off back in 2016 with the Acrasis album by Obscura, um, and now make that on a, on a on a higher level, so to speak. And I'm happy to report that that worked out, and I got an amazing band. Um, so the concept was to have a, a band for the entire album, right. not different musicians right. for each track, like I've been doing in the past. So build a band, um, and then 
wrote, wrote and recorded and engineered and produced and also mixed and mastered the album and brought in, in total, about 50 people for, as guest musicians um, because there's, it's all real. The entire album is, there's very little sampling or uh, artificial instruments. And um, so I brought in people for orchestral things, for choirs, for, um, there's a flamenco percussion part of a percussion section, um, the percussion hand claps right. that they do in flamenco music, all of those different things, a uh, gospel choir, um, the whole thing, and that obviously took a long time and a long, there was a long period of just recording and moving around and flying around to recording sessions, rec recording a church organ on location in a small church in the backwoods of Germany, all these things. And um, yeah, here we are almost three years later and the album is called Changeling. And I'm very happy with how it turned out. And I think it's the most cohesive um, thing I've ever done. And it's certainly a statement, like a bigger statement than I've made in the past in length, in scope, in budget, in the people involved. And I'm, I really can't wait until it's finally out in, in the world. Do you have any idea when we could hear it? Mm. Unfortunately, no, because uh, I've been doing the solo thing independent for a long time and that has worked out in the past. But because this project is such a big one um, and I've been working on it for the past three years, I really can't see myself going independent. And I'm currently trying to negotiate a label deal for the album so that the promotion and all the other stuff can be handled by professionals which i am not and that clearly determines when the album is going to be released so it could be in three months it could also be in a year which i don't yeah. hope but yeah right i'm sure everyone you played it too in india is looking forward to it as well I mean, <laughs> the yeah. reactions yeah. have been very good yeah, yeah. like i didn't know how this was going to go but people seem yeah. to really and like people it. already know the song names which is a great thing <laughs> <laughs> that is true yeah i mean i actually saw sid's reaction yesterday it's like he just became a prank to the front when you were oh, playing. Was, really? Oh, that was the song. That was uh, from the solo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Both yeah. me and Vishnu, we were like, oh, yeah. wow. Which one was that? Abyss. Abyss. Abyss it's yeah. always Abyss. Yeah. It's everybody's yeah, yeah, yeah. favorite. Yeah. yeah. Song is a vibe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. in fact, awesome. Like, in, especially it was, it was very cool because I think you were talking about composition mm -hmm. just before that song or just after that song. And uh, one of the things you mentioned is the importance of having a theme. Mm -hmm. Right? And... Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of got that vibe that yeah, this song has a theme. Mm -hmm. So, can you elaborate a little bit on the importance of having a theme? Because one of the things that even I was talking to you earlier, when, why, I, why I wanted a lesson was, my a lot of guitarists, myself included, we get stuck in this thing where we wake up and we're like, okay, I'm feeling this today and I record a couple of riffs, but it's just a minute, it's, you know, it can't be a song. Mm -hmm. So I go back to sleep, I wake up the next day, today I'm feeling another car, I just turn on the click at the same tempo, record on a couple of riffs. This process goes on for let's say seven days and I have seven minutes of riffs and then I just cut off the stuff mm -hmm. I don't like. But then what I'm left with isn't really a song, it's what I would call a riff stack. Riff salad. Yeah, it, yeah, riff salad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like riff, 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 riff. May not, you know, and then, and then either I have, I have to figure out how to really connect them together mm -hmm. Or I have to split them into different songs. Um, how does having themes help in that? And oh yeah, yeah. And I can relate to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like I was born writing themes. I had to learn that along the way, and I was very fortunate to come. Like I said, I haven't studied music, but um, I have found amazing people in my life who taught me the things that I know and that work well for me and by teaching it to others I also saw it work for a lot of other people. And I started out exactly like you were describing, writing riffs and trying to um, assemble different riffs written at different times, sometimes by different people, into a song and then struggling to make it coherent. Mm -hmm. Struggling to make it not a riff salad but a unified composition that has a vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, and along came a person into my life who's a legitimately studied classical composer, who was also the godfather of my, my first child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned so much from him. And one of the things was 
that I learned from him was working with themes and how that completely changes your mindset, your perception and your, your whole songwriting approach. Because if you think of a riff, uh, which is the all important thing for us guitar players, a riff, a riff is in 99.9% .9 of cases already a mixture of different ideas. And these ideas will be very specific. So most riffs work in a certain tempo and then in a certain key, in a certain position, with a certain playing style and a certain sound, mm -hmm. sound on guitar. That's the riff. Like you can't play smoke on the water with um, you know, a smooth jazz sound and maybe um, move it to a different position and play it without a pick and um, like all these sure, things and, yeah. and still, still expect it to work and give you the same impact as smoke on water. Right. So it becomes a different thing. Right. So riffs are a very specific thing and because of that there's a limit to what you can do with a riff. If it's not the riff to a large degree, with the same tempo, same sound, same palette, then it's something else and now you're stuck. Mm -hmm. Because you want to keep the riff going, uh, but then you need to develop the song. And these things can fight each other. Mm -hmm. So in a riff, however, you, in most cases, you have different ideas strung together. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been talking to this, I've been talking about this with Abbas uh, at his place a few days ago, and he showed me a riff he was working on. And the riff was really cool, but the riff already consisted of four different movements. And any of these movements could be a theme, um, but th there was four of them, so the amount of information is already pretty high. Mm -hmm. And so what I feel is a better alternative if you're stuck with that process, and don't get me wrong, that process can work great for, for people and have yielded, has yielded great results in the past. Um, but if you, you're getting stuck, what about trying to write a very simple, simple, simple theme? So maybe just a couple of notes. just two or three notes and then you try to take these notes and you use your expertise and your taste as a musician to arrange these notes on your instrument or on whatever you have available and try to make a statement with just those notes and that's your theme. Mm. And that becomes your starting point because once you get into this mindset of working with a simple theme like a classical composer, the amount of things that you can do with that theme, how you can arrange them and how you can build sections out of that theme um, just grows higher and higher and higher. The first time you do it, you're like, yeah, but what am I supposed to, to do with these three notes? Like, there's only so much I can do. The more you work on it, you're like, man, there's no end to what you can do with just three notes. And so the first step is building a theme and then that theme has to have, you have to have a decision in mind. What is it that you want to do? What kind of vibe and maybe emotion do you want this theme to evoke? And then you find a theme that already has that feeling. If it's a dissonant thing, like for example in the song Abyss, right. the basic theme is just a half step. Mind, yeah. It just goes from one note to the next lower note. And then in the song, I find about 45,000 odd little ways of going from that note to a lower note. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they, they're heard at the same time. Sometimes I slide, sometimes I bend. Um, in all different kinds of positions and chords, there's this half step movement. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the vibe, because it's a very dark vibe that I was going for. So I put this dark sounding dissonant interval and I came up with as many variations of that as I could possibly find. So you have to have an idea about what it is that you're going to do, find the theme that gives you that rough starting point, and then you permutate it, you start building parts. And then, like I said in the class yesterday, if you go from that standpoint, suddenly things become very easy because you have a reference point. You know what the vibe is, mm -hmm. you know what you're going for, and then whatever you come up with as a permutation of that theme, you can just compare and you, can, you get to say, this is the vibe, I decided this, that's the vibe. The thing that I've just been working on, is that the vibe? Yes, awesome, then I can take that and use it. If not, let me just keep working on it until it is the vibe. Right. And I find that is a very helpful tool for people who, like myself, who have not 
ha- enjoyed a very thorough theoretical education. I mm-hmm. try to get better at that all the time, but this method is democratic in a way that everybody knows their taste. Right? Right. Everybody knows what they like. Everybody knows about the music that makes them feel certain things. So if you go from that, this is the vibe, this is what I'm looking for, and then you compare your results to that and keep changing them up by jamming, by experimenting until it is the vibe, you get to build pieces that are very coherent. And then depending on how far you want to take it, you can get better and better and you can build more themes than one. You can make your theme you can build your theme out of 12 notes instead mm-hmm. of three so it's it's open-ended sure. but the most important thing is the shift in mentality in working with a tiny idea that you then change and permutate instead of working with a riff that may already encompass 15 different ideas right yeah sure no can't wait for my private lesson now <laughs> 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 so with this uh mindset going into writing because you've been writing all this the music how easy or difficult is it to have band uh, to explain this process to the, your band members and a drummer or a bassist? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that is a really good question because I found out um, during. I mean, I found found this out earlier in different in different sessions, but during this album, especially, there were. I, I'm so blessed to have been working with people um, who really got it and who just slid into that method and really respected what I was doing and I didn't have to explain anything. Okay. And if I work with the vocalist Florian, Florian mm-hmm. Magnus Meyer, who's one of my uh, a really good friend and one of my personal musical heroes, and I got to work with him on his album, you don't need to explain this to him. Yeah. He knows. Right. Like He's even a lot better and, at this process than right. I am, so he's like, yeah, this is the, ah, okay, okay, cool. Um, but then with other musicians, I quickly found out, even though they were extremely good at their instrument, they didn't get that. And right. they didn't, um, it was becoming very hard to work with them because they didn't respect the themes. Right. And they didn't hear a theme, they heard repetition. And then one person literally said to me, hey, if I repeat this pattern, this part, everybody is going to think I'm a bad instrumentalist. Mm. And I was having a hard time explaining to them that, no, this is not what it's about. It's about a theme that is repeated. And if you build a theme, this is another thing that I want to mention, if you work like this, uh, a theme is also something that you can recognize. And if the, the listener recognizes something coming back, it has an emotional reward. Mm. And you can, you can pl- probably think of a lot of examples in, in songs where that melody comes back mm-hmm. yeah. and you're like, oh, I've yeah. been waiting for this. Yeah. So that gives you the ability to build structures where you can create this tension and then a release of something that you worked on coming back and making an emotional impact. And that's the most beautiful thing. And if you work with people who don't get that perspective on what you're trying to do, it's it can become very tiresome and uh, so on this album with some people it's it's worked out perfectly with some it took a long time right. yeah and you weren't in the same room with them while they were work, you know, uh, working their parts obviously right depends with right. some with, uh, some people i wasn't yeah. and with some people i was and um i would have liked to be in the room with all of them and right. just make it a personal experience That's... because i don't want this music to be an impersonal job, get it done, get paid of kind of experience. Yeah. I really, we are, one of the concepts of the album is also to be real. Like right. this is technical death metal done without much editing, without, without oversampling and right. without um, virtual instruments. This is like all played by real people in right. real time. Not always on the first take, obviously, but like it's, it's a real thing. And um, I feel like being in a room together and explaining that and working towards that, even um, like also considering that I'm a music producer by profession, yeah. it's very important for me. And even though this album had a very big budget for my standards, uh, it's not always possible to fly around the world to record somebody. Yeah. And then you just have to find other ways. And it was a pandemic, so obviously right, that has <laughs> limitations yeah. as well. Yeah. But I would say 70% of the album has been recorded together in the room. Okay, oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I think we were also talking about it, like how 
there's I I feel like there's now a shift where in the metal scene we're going back to the raw sound, getting you know starting to recognize the advantages of that style, you know, moving away from sample drums, moving away from like super tight gated mm-hmm. guitars, and you know, uh, just getting back to the whole raw feeling that metal used to have. You know, like the albums that we all st- that made us fall in love with metal. Yeah, they weren't you know like super produced, tight, choppy, edited. Yeah. And stuff think, and that's why they all sounded a little bit different different yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think that also comes from the fact that now there's soon going to be AI generated music yeah. so you want to hear the humans play like humans <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, true yeah and I also feel like there's a hangover that happens like we all are f- we are burned out from AI not AI yet yeah, but like yeah. edited to a grid yeah, exactly. played like a robot exactly. as if an AI were right, to yeah. operate a board yeah. um, it's like I always give this example that back in the day when Fear Factory came out that was such a game changer mm-hmm. and it was a beautiful thing because they had a concept they actually had a lyrical concept to back up the fact that they were trying to sound like machines playing mm-hmm. and that was the biggest thing I was such a fan yeah. and I, f- I feel like that has been taken and abused <laughs> by the entire rest of the metal scene yeah. without that context, without purpose, just because it makes you seem better than you are with all the editing, the, the triggering. It can give you like a leg up in terms of how impactful your metal band sounds. But if you don't have a concept to back it up, it's basically just playing pretend. Mm. And Fear Factory had that concept, but does metalcore band XY from Pennsylvania have that concept? Mm. Do they have the the right to sound like machines just because everybody else is doing it? I don't want to like no, sure. bring negativity to whoever um, is is doing music, but I feel like we are, have all gotten ourselves into a situation where that has been gotten out of hand. Mm-hmm. And now I feel we are in this hangover period where yeah. people are getting really tired of that mm-hmm. for good reason. And I, I agree, it's like raw recordings, real people playing is coming back and uh, I'm here for it. Yeah. Well, we were talking even on the way to Mahabs that day, remember? We were talking about how plugins, mm-hmm. like, you know, not mm-hmm. to name any company, but plugins, everyone sounds the same now. Yeah. Because everyone has the exact same tone, there's literally no... Yeah, yeah. and there's option paralysis, I feel. Mm-hmm. like It's so great that we have all these tools, and I wouldn't be playing the set if I didn't have these tools. Mm-hmm. Um, just playing on a laptop, backing tracks through plugins. 15 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. So that's awesome, and um, so many good things have come out of that. But at the same time, because it's so easy and so convenient, I feel like for a lot of people, um, there is not this incentive anymore to take one piece of gear, one piece of sound, and to mold that and to learn how to use that to your, yeah. uh, to, to what it is that you have in mind. And when I was growing up and starting to play guitar, it was always clear that you could only imagine after a couple of years, you could maybe afford like one amp. Mm. You had to make a decision and that you're going to be stuck with that for the next five years. And then that's your sound and you will treat that sound, find your voice and then go from here. Now mm. it's like, yeah, I'm just going to get all the plugins on Black Friday and then I have all the guitar tones that we dreamed of as mm-hmm. at, at my fingertips. And then in that moment, that's awesome because you get to work really efficiently and, then and quickly. But then what? What? What is the thing that you do with it that nobody else has done? Yeah. Uh, do we even have the incentive with all these options to to go for that, to yeah. build a tone, to figure it out until you get there? Right. And I feel like the uncomfortable space from I don't know what I'm doing to ah, now I'm getting somewhere, it's getting lost, yeah. it's too convenient. Yeah. It's way too convenient in order for people to really develop their artistic voice. Right. And that's sad. Yeah, it's like, you know, I have 10 cars, but I don't know where to go with them. Exactly, yeah. 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 And that, that's, that doesn't mean that there's not still people out there who have a really strong artistic voice and mm-hmm. use those that technology. Um, but I feel like there's an over, overall trend mm. in the opposite direction. And l- just like with the editing and grid-based music, I feel there's going to be a hangover from that eventually. Mm. That people want uh, something 
unique and raw again. Yeah. yeah. So how are the workshops in general, just to kind of circle back to mm -hmm. the past couple of days, <clears throat> what was your experience with the workshops that you did here? Oh, well, I just came out of one, yeah. so it's really <laughs> fresh. <laughs> um, so first of all, I've literally had to like drag you from in between questions and be like, okay, we've got to go, we've got to, go, we got to do this thing. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's been great in the way that I have this opportunity to be here and to talk to these students and they're really eager to learn and that's beautiful to see that everybody is here to to learn and to grow together and uh, I feel you b built a place and a community here that really facilitates that and that is really amazing and it's kind of like the place where I would have wished to go when I was younger and then people get to network and to, to build each other up and I think that's super cool um, so that's really an awesome experience to be here and to hang and to not just go in talk about something and then get the hell out of there but also then to talk with people and then ask uh, answer follow-up questions and then learn about the experience of the students and why it is that they are asking a specific question mm -hmm. what their story is and then to interact with that so I find that to be really beautiful um, as for the workshops themselves, today was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed today's session. Yesterday, I feel I um, I felt really pressured mm -hmm. into delivering too many different topics in a short time. Uh, and I still think it was a valuable thing, but yesterday right. Just I didn't feel 100% good about what I delivered, right. to be perfectly for, honest. For, for context, yesterday was... The guitar technique and the composition. Yes, guitar technique and composition. And, composition. and I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I had to basically do both in in a, one long session. Right. And uh, I, I think I overestimated my own ability to deliver all this these different types of information coherently right. in one session. And so today I made the effort to just focus, right. use the time that we have for one topic and it has been really rewarding. And today's was mental health for musicians. And today was mental health for musicians, which yeah. is something that's really important yeah. to me. And I think like when we were planning this out, you mentioned that that's something that you definitely want to yes. talk about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like do you, you feel like that's something which um, is, uh, do you think that's something that every musician must definitely kind of take care of and look at? I mean, do you think it's not cared about enough? Mm. I wouldn't use the word must mm -hmm. because that's a personal decision. Sure. And there may be people out there who have a certain path where that is not really any concern. And that's great. But I feel like for the overwhelming majority of people, mental health is a big concern. Mm. Um, and I think in the year 2023, post-pandemic, mental health is a bigger concern than it was ever for all of us. Um, I don't know about you guys, but the pa pandemic was a very difficult mental oh, health absolutely. time for myself in isolation. Uh, and I hear that from so many people. And that's just one example. So I think the topic is really big. And I feel that musicians are prone to more struggles and more intense struggles with mental health because of the way that this profession is we are putting ourselves out there in very high pressure situ situations mm -hmm. which is not for everybody which is a learning curve and there's expectations there's all these pressures of being a musician then we are in the business of basically communicating emotion and uh, we have to navigate our own emotions we have to be in touch with our emotions and we oftentimes we became musicians because we struggle with our own emotions I know I have mm -hmm. um, and a lot of musicians that I know especially in the metal scene they have been going into this line of work into this area of music because they didn't have an outlet for their emotions um, when they were growing up and then this music had given them an outlet uh, the voice of the voiceless right? Right. and we metal musicians we pride ourselves of being this outlet for difficult and intense emotions and aggression and mm -hmm. anger and dissatisfaction and 
uh, also depression. That's what metal is. It gives us a vehicle to deal with these. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we get better. We, we have a vehicle, an outlet, that's great. But at the same time, to really find balance and healing, I think we as a musicians community need to talk about this more because there's so much information about mental health but there's very little information about how mental health specifically relates to musicians and the situations that we experience as musicians, the good as well as the bad. And mm -hmm. it's a very particular situation to be in. And I guess maybe you guys can back me up on this. Like, do you sometimes find that as musicians, a lot of people can't relate to what you're going through and what your, your routine and your day and your struggles are? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think. Not just as a musician, but as anyone who's, uh, you know, in a creative performing art form, um, definitely. I think, like for example, insecurity mm. right, is the number one thing. If 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 a musician, right, like end of the day, what what are we trying to do? We're trying to put music out. We're trying to put put our creativity out. How's that going to be gauged? Yeah. What are people going to think? Is it good enough? Should I be create? Should I be uh, putting out emotions or should it just be like oh look how fast I can play or look how complex I can play is look how should I play something that no one else can play yeah or should I make a sound which I feel is coming from inside I think these things of course someone who's not a musician would probably not be able to relate to these kind of uh, doubts and insecurities that 100% have. that was very well well worded mm -hmm. exactly and I feel that there's a need mm -hmm among the musicians community to talk about that and maybe also a need to make the people outside our community aware of the struggles that we are facing mm -hmm. um, because we have needs and rights too we may be on stage performing but that, that doesn't give anybody else the right to just walk all over us and say well I paid for this gig so you now be the dancing monkey and I see you crying I see you being depressed I see you being ha having a hard time but I pay for this so you better perform mm -hmm. now or else and I feel like if we can navigate this and talk about these different things then we can create a better sense, a deeper sense of understanding, um, which may prevent struggles in the future. Yeah. Oh. So. What's next for Tom Fountainhead? More coffee. Um, <laughs> more coffee, yeah, no, for sure. Mm. Well, right now, more teaching, mm -hmm. more focus on on your beautiful students today mm -hmm. and hopefully try to get to answer all the burning questions mm -hmm. um, that I can. And then tomorrow I, f I fly home, unfortunately, which is a very strange feeling mm -hmm. after these three weeks. And uh, then it, it's right back into work back in Germany, mm -hmm. recording, playing, um, finishing up the Dolby Atmos mix, the special audio mix for my new album, which okay. is a thing that I've been getting into lately, which is really fascinating to me, spatial audio. Mm. Um, and yeah, negotiating the album deal, all these things that are in flux right now. So no rest for the wicked, I guess. Back to business. Yeah. Basically. And then Abbas and I have already talked about it. I would really, really like to do another solo tour and to build this into an, an ongoing thing. I would really like to go on tour with you again and maybe um, do different shows, different cities, different, mm -hmm. come back here with a full band, all these things that... Um, Same workshops though. <laughs> <laughs> all these things that are now, that I have been doing this tour, are maybe possible and see what is possible and um, what's not and then just take it from here. Yeah, awesome. The 2023 tour was a teaser. <laughs> yeah, that's what we've been saying all along. It's, yeah. it's a teaser and it's a test drive and it's an experiment. But now that we have had that experience yeah. where do we go from here and I would I would re like like I said earlier some things have worked some things haven't worked mm -hmm. um, but the fact that some things haven't worked out the way I wanted to um, just gives me the incentive right now to keep going and to do those things better and differently next time and to take it to the next level because there is clearly something good happening and I want to not you miss the opportunity to build that up to a high level and do it again. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, 
Once again, I think on behalf of everyone here at Sam, thank you so much because uh, I think we obviously expected a lot, uh, but our expectation was nothing compared to I think what our students have actually gotten <laughs> in the sense that you know it was, it was a lot more. Especially I think a lot of the um, you know the, the stuff that you're talking about, stuff like mental health and yeah. the emotions and the, you know just the concept of all those things. I think a lot of people were expecting like fretless guitar masterclass and right. you know composition masterclass, but this was this is something which was uh, um, unexpected but great. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, and definitely, I think next time when you are in India, we definitely love to host you again. Oh, and that'd be amazing! I would love to. Yeah, yeah. That. awesome. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you so thank, much for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abbas, for thank bringing Tom. Yes, <laughs> And, thank uh, you, <laughs> and thanks for the hospitality and the opportunity and everything that you you're doing here and uh, being super chill and um, also understanding of my my own chaos <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Oh, you're most welcome. <laughs>